take your copy of God's Word and turn to John 12. I hope you held your place there, perhaps. John chapter 12. We are just about to complete what most theologians call in the Gospel of John the Book of Signs. First 12 chapters, many theologians call it the Book of Signs. And there's a clear break then, chapter 13 and onward, press into the final teachings of Jesus before his passion on the cross. John 12, we're jumping right back into the middle of a back and forth dialogue between Jesus and the crowd. Some Greeks, of course, have come seeking Jesus. And as you might remember from a few weeks ago in verse 23, Jesus uses that as a launch pad to begin to talk about the cross, his impending death. So just to go back and pick up the context of verse 23, and Jesus answered them, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And then in verse 24, right after speaking of glory, he speaks of a grain of wheat falling into the earth and dying that it might bear much fruit. Let's pick it up at verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this reason, for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. Others said an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And now John gives us, just in case we don't get it, this God-breathed interpretation. He said this, John says, to show by what kind of death he was about to die. The crowd answered him, therefore, we have heard from the law that the Christ remains forever. How can you say that the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? This is the word of God. Let's pray. Who indeed is this Son of Man? God, will you make the answer to that question plain? To every heart, mind, soul, and life gathered here today, young and old, reveal yourself in Christ our Lord, we pray, for your sake, for our salvation. Amen. About A.D. 155, there was a Christian apologist, that's one who defends the faith or gives reasoned answers for the faith, and his name was Justin Martyr. It wasn't his real name. Justin was his real name, but he became called Justin Martyr because he was martyred for the faith, one of the earliest. He wrote what is now known as Dialogue with Trufo the Jew. Now, we don't know if Trufo was an actual Jew that Justin was in dialogue with or if Trufo was just his fictional character so that he could write a defense of the faith to the Jewish people and urge them to trust in Jesus as the Messiah and the Lord. Whether or not Trufo was a real Jew or not, what is ascribed to him in this writing by Justin Martyr is certainly what Jews have been saying for thousands of years when it comes to Jesus 
In chapter 32, for example, Truffaut the Jew says, quote, According to Scripture, the Son of Man is to be full of honor and glory and establish the eternal kingdom. And he references Daniel 7. That's the classic Son of Man text. But your so-called Christ was without honor or glory and was struck by the worst curse in the law of God by being crucified, end quote. I recently watched a video of a Jewish scholar refuting the idea that Isaiah chapter 53 was about Jesus or that it was about a Messiah at all. This in spite of many ancient rabbis' commentaries that said Isaiah 53 clearly is about a Messiah. But he said it can't be about Jesus and it can't be about a Messiah because he said Messiah is to come and establish an everlasting political kingdom of peace over the whole world from the city of Jerusalem. And since Jesus did not do that, certainly not in any literal way, his argument was he cannot then be the Messiah. This is precisely the view of Messiah that the crowd gathered around Jesus on the very day John describes. It's their view. It's why they're so confused, why they're consternated about what Jesus says. They're gathered for a Passover, and Jesus is hammering home who he is. Who he is. Jesus is the crucified, glorified Christ. That's the point. It's what Jesus has been laying before the crowd <clears throat> repeatedly, but he is really hammering it home now. I chose those words carefully. I ordered them carefully. Jesus is the crucified, glorified Christ. That's the point being made. And John gives us five movements in our passage today, all unified by that truth that Jesus is the crucified glorified Christ and I have lumped those five movements under five headings heading number one Christ consuming commitment that's what we see in verses 27 and 28 if I had only said and if Jesus had only said to the Jewish crowd gathered around him that day that he was the glorified son of man they wouldn't have had much problem at all. It's the crucified part that they cannot swallow. That he is the crucified, glorified. Remember he started in verse 23 by saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man. That title right out of Daniel 7. That Son of Man, that Ancient of Days, hands him the everlasting kingdom in Daniel 7. He is going to be glorified. The time has come. And then he immediately talks about death. And now what he began to talk uh, about in metaphoric illustration with the grain of wheat that falls into the earth and dies, now he begins to flesh that out with more plain language. And we see immediately in verse 27 and 28 that Jesus Christ has a consuming commitment to the cross. We see it by way of two prayers. Do you see both prayers in verse 27 and 28? Some translations, mine included, make the first prayer a question. Father, save me from this hour. I don't agree with that. I don't, the Greek doesn't have any punctuation. That's a decision they made. I don't think it's part of a question. I think it's a prayer. What shall I say? My soul, he says, is disturbed, distressed, churning. It's troubled now. What shall I say? And then a prayer. Father, save me from this hour. And then a second prayer. Father, glorify your name. It bothers some people that Jesus' soul was in distress here. The verb means it's being tossed and turned. It's churning. His guts are in a knot, we might say today. 
I don't know why that would bother anyone. What it ought to do is cause us to shut our mouths and stand in awe of our Savior, our Christ, our Lord. The Word became flesh. That's the point of John's gospel from almost the first verse. God became a man. Jesus is God, man. And therefore, only Jesus can possibly know or experience or feel the full weight of what he is now facing within just a few days. As Peter puts it, he himself bore our sins in his own body on the cross. We sing rightly, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sin upon that cross. Do you believe that? Only Jesus could have this kind of gut churning, soul stirring, because only he could possibly bear the weight of God's fiery wrath against the countless sins of countless sinners down through the generations. We truly never will know how much it cost to see our sin upon that cross. But I am rejoicing that the soul tossed, uh, the storm tossed soul rather of Jesus doesn't have the final word. Do you see this? Uh, John doesn't give us the agony of Gethsemane the way Matthew, Mark, and Luke do, but he gives us a close parallel here, doesn't he? Do you see the similarities, the two prayers? In Gethsemane, Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell us he said, Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. But no sooner had that come out of his sinless lips than he says what? Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Do you see the parallels? What shall I say in John's gospel here? Father, save me from this hour. No sooner has it left his pure lips than his consuming commitment to the Father's glory wins out. No, for this purpose, this is why I came. This hour of agony on behalf of God's glory and the good of my people that I will redeem. This is why I came. My consuming commitment, Father, is that you be glorified. Oh, what a Savior. You've never seen a man or a woman like this who will literally go through hell for the glory of God the Father. Whatever it takes, God. Whatever it takes, Jesus is saying. I am absolutely consumed by a commitment to see your name, who you are, and what you do in saving sinners. To be magnified and praised and glorified throughout the earth. Jesus was born for this hour. And we ought to shut our mouths and stand in awe. Paul says that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. See how he heightens that? Not just any old death, it was death on the cross. And it wasn't just the physical suffering that the Bible writers have in mind. In fact, I have said to you repeatedly over our 11 years together here, church, the, the New Testament writers don't really make much at all about the physical part of the cross. All kinds of people were physically crucified by Rome. It's the wrath of God being poured out on Jesus for our sins that is highlighted by the gospel writers. And the writer of Hebrews says it was even the joy set before Christ that he endured the cross, despising the shame, and he is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. No wonder God the Father thundered in answer to his son Jesus' prayer. Father, save me from this hour. Father, glorify your name. That's my consuming commitment and my passion. God the Father answers his son, I have glorified it. And in context, he means I have glorified it in you, son. And I will most definitely glorify it again on the cross, son. You rest assured 
This is God's glory. This is how he's glorified. I, I made much of this. I tried anyway a couple weeks ago when Jesus talked about the grain of wheat falling into the earth. This is his glory. It's not just a pathway to glory. The cross is God's glory in Jesus Christ. This is his purpose, his mission. This hour predestined by God is now upon him. And it will certainly, God says, from heaven redound to his glory and the fame of his name. I tell you, Jesus is the crucified, glorified Christ. Jesus' consuming commitment to God's glory is unprecedented. It is unparalleled and unsurpassed. The self-sacrifice that Jesus just demanded of his followers in verse 24 and 25. Remember that from two weeks ago? You want to follow me, you got to die. You got to hate your life. You got to deny yourself. Jesus never asked us to do anything. He's not gone before us and already done. And he's done on our behalf. He now makes it clear. He's headed to Calvary. But the crowd is confused. That's our second heading. The crowd's clouding comprehension. Verse 29. The voice booms from heaven. And verse 29 says, The crowd heard something, said it thundered. I'd been studying this passage with Brother Seth Griffin a few weeks ago, and he mentioned, as we studied through it, that uh, thunder was associated with God's presence on Mount Sinai and in the Old Covenant in particular. And I have to be honest, that was a connection that I hadn't made in my study. But it's a connection you would think a crowd full of Jews might at least consider. Well, thunder's surrounding that maybe God's involved in some way here. I mean, God is surrounded by thunder and clouds and lightning and great glory. That wasn't a connection they made. Others seemed to know it was at least a voice. They didn't understand anything the voice said. It must have been an angel. It sounded like a voice. Maybe it was an angel. They're both wrong. They're both wrong. Will you turn back to John chapter 5? As you're turning there, I want to ask a question, and I'm going to answer the question, or John is going to answer the question emphatically for us next week. We'll come back next week in our passage, and we'll see John's answer to the question, but we should be raising this question now as we're reading, why in the world can't, it seems like no one in this crowd except Jesus can hear the voice of God. Why can't they discern the voice of God? John chapter 5, verse 37. And Jesus says this to unbelieving Jewish leaders. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you because you do not believe. In the one whom he has sent. Why can't they discern that at bare minimum it's the voice of God? Well, again, I'll say more about this as we plow into John's answer next week. But suffice it to say today, nobody apart from grace discerns the voice of God. You must be given ears to hear by God. A heart to understand. We are seeing the depravity of the crowd on display here. And we're right there with them apart from the great of God, grace of God in Christ. We too would have uncircumcised ears and uncircumcised hearts if God doesn't give us saving grace in Christ our Lord. See what Jesus so graciously does for these unbelievers in the crowd. Do you see what he does for them in verse 30? He begins to interpret for them. Jesus says, the voice wasn't for me. Jesus has no need of the Father's affirmation in this. And back, you remember in um, chapter 11, when he stood at Lazarus' tomb, he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, past tense. 
And then he said, and I know that you always hear me. So the father and son are talking perfectly to one another in perfect union and communion all the time. Jesus doesn't need this voice for his sake or to bolster his confidence. It's not for him. It's for the unbelieving crowd. It's for them. And so they get the benefit now of mediated grace. And that's exactly who Jesus is, the mediator between God and man. They get the benefit of Jesus being God's interpreter. That's exactly who John says Jesus is in chapter 1 of his gospel, verse 18. That he has come from the bosom of the Father and he is God's exegete. Literally, the Greek says, he makes God known to us. He is God's self-revelation in the flesh. Literally, God being made known to mankind. And so Jesus is acting the part. It's interesting, isn't it? That he doesn't tell them the precise words God said. He doesn't say, listen, crowd, this voice was for your sake. Let me tell you exactly what God just said to me. He said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. Now, what Jesus does is he interprets the meaning and then applies it directly to the cross. He interprets what, what was God the Father really getting at there? What is the actual meaning of what God the Father just said to the Son? It is that Jesus is the crucified, glorified Son of Man. It is on the cross that God's glory will be most displayed. He begins to immediately apply and interpret what is about to happen on the cross. How in the world will God's name be made great in all the earth as he promised through the prophet Malachi? My name, he said, will be great among all the nations. Jesus tells this crowd, when I am lifted up from the earth, that's how. The cross is how God's name is made great throughout the earth. It's in the cross, through the cross, by the cross. The cross is Christ's conquering crusade, if I can say it that way. Christ conquering cross is our next heading, and that's what he focuses on in verses 31 and thir through 33. When he begins to interpret God's heavenly voice, we get to the nexus of it all when he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth. The Greek there, some translate it, if I, but that's an emphatic if in the Greek. It speaks of a certain future condition. It's not if, it's when. When I am lifted up from the earth. That verb lifted up is clearly a reference to the cross, and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. We know that from John's gospel. It's not just that Christ is going to be crucified. Listen, it's not just that he's going to be hung on a cross. Who crucified people? Romans. And only Rome. And the crowd gets it. In a minute you'll see it's why they ask the question. Turn with me to John chapter 18. I want you to see this from John's own gospel. Jesus says when I am, if I can just say it the way we would say it today. When I am crucified by Rome. That's what he's saying. When I am lifted up from the earth. In John 18, verse 31, Pilate said to them, that is the Jewish leaders, right? Who are crying out for the blood of Jesus. He says, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Now look what John says. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was about to die. Exact words in our text that John says in verse 33 of chapter 12, which we're in. This is about being crucified by Rome. The Jews aren't allowed to do this. I hope you're starting to see 
why these Jews were so befuddled. How in the world can the cross be anything other than a defeat? Maybe the Jews should have read their scriptures more carefully. Will you go back with me to Isaiah chapter 52? Old Testament prophecy of Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah 52, beginning at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, that is the exact same verb Jesus uses in John 12. When I be high and lifted up from the earth, he shall be exalted. Isaiah says, verse 14, as many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. So he shall sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand. And then it goes right into Isaiah 53. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. He has borne our sorrows and carried our griefs. And it pleased the Lord to crush him. Why would you somehow think of exaltation, if you're a Jew reading that passage, as only ruling the world politically from the throne of Jerusalem? When in that context, Isaiah says his exaltation will come by death on behalf of of the sins of his people. This is exactly what Jesus is hammering home for this crowd. His cross is not a defeat. It's actually a victory. Lifted up was he to die. It is finished was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a savior. Christ's double exaltation is mind blowing, isn't it? Lifted up from the earth on the cross, lifted up to the right hand of the Father until his enemies be made his footstool. But Jesus wants this crowd to know, as he is squarely focused now upon the cross, that this cross is his victory. This cross is God's glory. And everything, everything the Bible anticipates happening at the end of time. Jesus says it's inaugurated at the cross. Now is the judgment of this world. That's end time stuff if you read the Old Testament. Now is the judgment of this world. What world? The world John is most fond of when he uses that word. He usually means, not always, but usually. The world full of sinners who are raging against God and his Christ. The world that is set in their wickedness and hates God and hates his Christ and hates his ways. That world, the cross is a judgment upon them. The world nailed Jesus to the tree. But as scholar D.A. Carson aptly noted, quote, the world thought that it was passing judgment on Jesus, but the cross was passing judgment on them. God always gets the final word. Are you listening? God always gets the final word. The cross is the final word, and it is a judgment upon the world. The sins of the world were judged there for all who will call out upon the name of Jesus and be saved. And otherwise, it is the standard by which the world will then be cast into the lake of fire. Now, Jesus says, now, it's about to happen now, the judgment of this world. Now. The ruler of this world, and then he uses future tense verb, will be cast out. Now, the ruler of this world, clearly a reference to Satan, the devil. The cross spells Satan's doom. And you and I could spend a lot of time at a coffee shop or over a steak talking about exactly what this does and doesn't mean. But if we just simply today, for the sake of time, let a few scriptures interpret this scripture for us. 
The cross certainly does spell Satan's doom, but the scripture says the devil is still prowling like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. And John himself in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 says, the whole world lies, present tense right now, in the power of the evil one. So Satan is not totally cast out and chucked into the lake of fire yet. The scripture won't allow that interpretation of what Jesus means. So I think the best way to think about this, we keep it in its immediate context and follow me here. The devil, because of the cross, is like the British at the Battle of New Orleans in 1814. That war, if you know anything about history, was already over. The British had already officially surrendered to America. But news traveled kind of slowly back then. And so Andrew Jackson's Tennesseans and Kentuckians with their squirrel rifles didn't get the note, neither did the British. And just like the Americans shoved the British right back into the Gulf of Mexico, and so ever since the cross, Jesus has just been mopping up Satan. Just a mopping up operation that's happening. And if we don't disconnect Jesus' words here, and you shouldn't, you see the primary way that this happens according to Jesus, is by his crucifixion, by his cross. You see the little word and in verse 32? That's a connector. It's, it's letting us know this is not, these are not disjointed thoughts. They are integrated, integral. Now is the world judged. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, when I, and lift it up from the earth, will draw all kinds of people, that's the sense, all kinds of people to myself. How is Satan cast out over and over and over? How is he mopped up over and over and over every time Jesus draws a sinner to faith in himself? Every time that happens, Satan loses again. Every single time, he's mopped up again as Jesus calls from Calvary and draws. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? Back in John 6, 44, many of you have it memorized, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless my Father in heaven who sent me draws him. Same verb, it means to compel irresistibly. And now Jesus says, when I am crucified, I will compel irresistibly all kinds of people all over the world to myself. So which one is it? Yes. Yes, Jesus has also already said that you are hopeless unless you're born of the Spirit, John chapter 3. You cannot divide God when it comes to salvation. Our God is a Savior God. He is indivisible in his saving work of sinners. And God glorifies his name by judging the sinful world, by casting out Satan. And he does this each and every time. He compels, draws, woos a sinner to look upon the crucified Christ and say, glory, that's my glory. I'm going to follow the crucified, glorified Christ. He is my Lord. But not so fast, says the crowd. John wants to make sure his readers get it. Verse 33, he's talking about his crucifixion at the hands of Rome, John says, and the crowd gets it. Their, their answer, their response to Jesus is not stupid, but it is unenlightened. Now, there's a huge difference. You ought to be careful when you're talking to lost people, by the way. 
you, if you're not careful, you get arrogant, you can treat them like they're stupid. No, they're just unenlightened. Like you would be without the saving grace of God in Christ. They're not stupid. It's unlike, I mean, they've actually read the law. The, the law does say that the Christ, his kingdom is forever. Daniel 7, where Jesus began, remember in verse 23, Jesus began this dialogue by referring to himself as the son of man. Now the hour's here, he says, the son of man to be glorified. That's right out of Daniel 7. And Daniel 7 does not mention death. For the Son of Man, it says his kingdom is everlasting and it shall not be destroyed. This was the promise God made to David, right? In 2 Samuel 7. I will sit someone on your throne forever. Psalm 89 reaffirms the promise. The throne shall last forever. Psalm 110 verse 4 affirms the promise. The messianic throne will not pass away. It shall last forever. Isaiah 9 7. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Ezekiel 37, 25. And that's just a few I've listed. They're right. These Jews are right. The law does actually say that the Christ, the Messiah, is forever. He abides, he lives, he reigns forever and ever. So what gives? Jesus' answer does it seem disconnected to you? Jesus gives clear commands. To the crowd's conflicted question, we get Christ's clear commands. Walk. Believe. While you have the light. The light of the world is only among you a little while longer. You better walk. You better follow me. You better believe in me. While I'm still here, while you still have time, that you might be sons of light. That's not disconnected, friends. Not at all disconnected. To the Jew, the law was their light. The law says that about itself, does it not? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Here's what Jesus is urging them and us to understand. The law was a lesser light designed in eternity by God to derive its glory only from the greater light who is the son of the living God, the son of man who is the son of God. The law is the moon. The moon has no glory at all. It cannot even be seen as glory without the light of the sun. That's Jesus' command to you today as well. What light are you following? Do you understand Jesus' urgency here? I mean, he is, he is pressing urgency upon these listeners and these people. And next week, come back and we'll see. Do you understand? God does not owe you this moment. I know, oh, it's a little late. I mean, we, we had a, a lot going on. I'm a little tired. I'm a little hungry. Listen. If you leave here without believing in the light of the world who is Jesus Christ and you go out that door and have a heart attack, you're going to hell. God, Listen, kids, boys, girls, look up here. God doesn't owe you this moment. Young people die too. Death doesn't care. Are you going to assume you have more time? Is that what you want to do today? I know we don't have clocks that go TikTok anymore. I do in my house because I like listening to TikToks. I'm a weird guy like that. Did you ever just sit in silence and listen? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick. It may not mean you're dead, literally. It may just mean, you know what? That was the last opportunity God's going to give to you. God is God. He doesn't owe anyone any opportunities to repent and believe in the gospel. The fact that he gives it to you at all is sheer grace and mercy. Will you, will you look 
at that mercy now and spit on it? I'm begging you, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Believe in the light that is Christ. Walk in the light that is Christ, because only in his light can you see light. Lord, help us. We don't know when that last opportunity is, God, that you have ordained that that's it. <coughs> no more opportunity. Fate is sealed. God, have mercy. I pray that would not be true for anyone here, but more than that, I pray that everyone here would just believe. Give them grace, God. Open their eyes. Help them give up any lesser lights that they're following and come to the greatest light. The light of the world who is Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the crucified, glorified Christ. Will you now be glorified in us? And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.